All right. Um, welcome each and one of you to the European Parliament. My name is Per Holmgren. I'm one of the two hosts this um, afternoon or, or lunchtime or whatever it is, morning. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a member of the Swedish Greens, uh, uh, MEP in the Environmental uh, Committee and also the Agri Committee. Uh, and as you all probably are aware of uh, this um, uh, session, this uh, uh, these two and a half hours or maybe a bit more uh, is um, organized by the Stockholm Environment Institute, whom I've had the pleasure to cooperate with during many different occasions during the last 10 years or, or whatever. Um, uh, and also, of course, the um, uh, Institute for European Environmental Policy. Uh, and my co-host is Sara Matthew. Uh, I, I know that you need to leave a bit early, but I will be staying for the whole session. So once again, uh, each and one of you, very, very welcome to the European Parliament. Hi, everyone. Also from, uh, from my side, uh, really wonderful uh, to see all of you here in the Parliament. And indeed, I apologize. Uh, I won't be able to stay very long, uh, but I'm happy uh, to, uh, to do some opening words uh, on this very important uh, topic. And it's, it's great to see that uh, EEP and the Stockholm Environment Institute are actually working uh, on the topic. Uh, I think in the political area, uh, most of the attention right now goes to to uh, tackling the climate ambitions um, generated within national borders, of course. And well, that's not a surprise um, because, well, relatively speaking, uh, it's easier uh, to monitor those emissions and uh, to create then policy measures uh, to reduce them. But uh, I think that we will hear uh, from the other speakers today that that actually hides a large part of the problem. And well, um, maybe to explain the political uh, significance of that, uh, I'll give you an example from my backyard, uh, from Belgium. We have a huge discussion going on uh, in Flanders on the port of Antwerp. Uh, this is an area that hosts one of the largest chemistry clusters in Europe. Um, and well, a few years ago, uh, the industry giant Ineos, they decided there to build a new production plant to create feedstocks for the plastic uh, sector. And while the company actually wants to do that uh, by shipping ethane from the United States, and well, this ethane is essentially produced by fracking uh, gas in rock formations. I'm sure you're all aware of that. And well, uh, you probably also know that there's more and more evidence that fracking and uh, the leaking gas transport infrastructure actually leads to enormous uh, emissions. Um, in fact, in some cases, they even em emit uh, more than coal. And the thing is, of course, that those emissions don't actually appear in the overview of the Belgian emissions. Um, and that's why a lot of policymakers don't really care uh, or are not aware uh, of, that, uh, of that fact. But I think that there's an extra dimension uh, to this, and that is that, well, INEOS is fracking to create additional supply for the plastics industry, when we know that actually there's a global oversupply already. And, well, that means that this kind of investment in Antwerp and, of course, also in other places, is actually depressing uh, the prices of virgin plastics even more and that they will become much more attractive uh, than the recycled uh, feedstocks. And I think that's bad news because, well, that comes at a time where recyclers are already facing problems in remaining competitive uh, with the producers of virgin plastics. And that matters a lot, uh, of course, because, well, recycled plastics, uh, reused materials, as you know, they will emit uh, far fewer uh, emissions than uh, the virgin ones. And so, well, these new uh, production facilities by Antwerp, um, by Ineos in Antwerp, they will aggravate uh, our problem because, well, they are continuing, of course, to rely on fossil uh, value chains and they give the oil and the gas sector uh, a new lease on life. 
And of course, they're also boosting the overproduction and undermining uh, the circular economy and uh, the demand reduction. And I think that the problem in this uh, particular case is that the policymakers are actually boosting and supporting uh, such investments without actually seeing that bigger picture. Um, so what happens is that they will require uh, the installation uh, to do carbon capture and storage, uh, often something way in the future, of course. Uh, we don't really have guarantees that it will happen. But, well, when you look at the emissions upstream, we know that nothing uh, will happen because, well, right now there are too little uh, incentives for policymakers and for businesses to look at the consumption based uh, footprints, whether it's in, in terms of uh, emissions or uh, in terms of uh, the material footprint. And well, just to briefly say, I know that that is not uh, the topic of today, uh, but I do want to highlight how important that uh, material footprint is because it's a very good proxy for uh, the climate emissions. Uh, by using fewer materials, uh, we need, of course, less production, less energy use, uh, and that will lead to fewer uh, climate emissions. So I think it's clear that we need more incentives uh, towards uh, the outsourcing of our emissions to the third countries as we bring down our own uh, domestic uh, emissions. And well, I think it's problematic because Already today, as you all know, our uh, consumption footprint is higher than people elsewhere in the world. And, well, I think that there's essentially two avenues uh, that we can take uh, as policymakers what, where we should invest more. Uh, one is more trade-related uh, and the other one is related uh, to the demand reduction in the EU. And, well, I think, in my opinion, there is some good news. Um, well at least let's clarify that good news with uh, with some examples uh, that I had the opportunity to work on uh, in the recent years here uh, in European Parliament. First, trade. Uh, I'm a member of, uh, of the trade uh, committee. As you know, uh, we have the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, now in place uh, in the next uh, few years to come. Uh, to actually ensure that the producers of cement, of steel and so on uh, in third countries also will pay for their climate pollution. And I think that that's an effective way uh, to stop handing out the free pollution permits in the EU, of course, and that will help us bring down uh, the domestic emissions. But I think that it's also um, a major breakthrough uh, to reduce the outsourcing uh, of our industrial production that we then uh, re-import. And the system will allow us, of course, also to better monitor uh, those emissions embedded uh, in the imported goods because, well, foreign producers will be incentivized to provide uh, that accurate information about the emissions of their uh, production methods. Now, as a political group, uh, as Greens, we've been asking for that uh, for the past 20 years or so. And, well, finally, we have it. So that's good news. At the same time, of course, we wanted to include more sectors. Uh, we wanted to expand uh, the scope to also the intermediate products uh, to make it a much more uh, effective law. We didn't get that, unfortunately, but I think politically speaking, uh, we have achieved a major, a major step forward. And well, I think that there's uh, a major lesson to be learned, and that is uh, to understand how actually to convince uh, the stakeholders and other political groups uh, that we have an interest in such measures. Because, well, with CBAM, it were really the big sectors like the steel industry, for instance, uh, that really saw uh, the sign on the wall. They opened the door uh, to support it because they knew that they needed uh, an alternative uh, for the existing system of those uh, free allowances. And well, uh, that system would become obsolete, of course, uh, as emissions in the EU decline in the coming years. And the sector is actually facing a lot of competition due to, uh, amongst other things, the higher energy prices. So creating that level playing field uh, with CBAM was also in their uh, geostrategic and, uh, and economical interest. So it's clear, uh, sadly, we need more than just the environmental uh, perspective and, uh, and the moral uh, arguments. Um, but then uh, let's also talk uh, demand reduction. Um, well, I would like to highlight in, in that effect uh, the new eco-design legislation. Uh, it's another, I think, very relevant uh, topic that I was fortunate enough 
to uh, to negotiate on uh, in this parliament. So um, from around 2025, roughly speaking, it's not 100% clear. It will demand. It, it will depend, of course, on the Commission when they will come up with their delegated act. We will see uh, a major flurry of uh, circular design criteria for products like textiles, like furniture, uh, but also steel, chemicals, uh, and so on. And so depending on the product, uh, they will become uh, more reusable, more recyclable, more repairable. Um, and the carbon and environmental footprint also uh, will become a requirement. And that will apply to all products, uh, both from uh, third countries, uh, both domestic as well. And again, it will create that level playing field. Uh, but it will also decrease uh, the demand for products uh, because, of course, they will be more robust. They will last longer. And I think that that is really going to make a huge impact. I'm quite sure of that. Um, but what is missing right now? Well, we have the requirements uh, that we need. They are all there. So there is a direction uh, of travel, um, but there's no real goal on the horizon. I mean, that the, the law doesn't really state an ambition as we have it, for instance, of course, in our climate uh, ambitions. Uh, we know where we want to end up uh, in 2050. And well, uh, I think that that matters a lot because, well, the Commission in its next mandate, of course, uh, will develop how ambitious uh, the eco-design rules should be. And I think it's problematic uh, because that's really a political issue. So far, uh, we don't really have any consumption-based objectives uh, like we have that uh, for, do for the domestic uh, emissions. So uh, let me conclude uh, by saying that, well, the next Circular Economy Action Plan or uh, the EU at large, uh, I think, should really include such objectives. I think many countries and regions like the Netherlands, Flanders, Austria actually have uh, a material footprint target. I think that the EU should have them too. And, well, I hope uh, that the event and the result, of course, of, of the very important work that you are doing here uh, can really contribute to that. Voilà. Thank you very, very much, Sarah, and I hope you can stay for a short while at least. Uh, and now I think it's Timothy yes. who will be in charge for the rest, more or less. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me first of all uh, ask everyone to give a hand, round of applause to our two co-hosts. Uh, yeah, uh, it's fantastic to see a full room here today to discuss this exciting topic. My name is Tim Suliada. I'm a senior fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute. I'm also a researcher who was involved in the project that sits behind the event today. It's funded by the European Climate Foundation. So uh, what I'd like to do is run us through the agenda for today. Um, as I say that, we um, have started the recording and this will be uh, published online afterwards, so you're aware. Uh, during the call, during the discussion today, we can uh, have some tweets going out on X, so please engage uh, as you go along. So we've uh, just about, to, I'm about to give a, a short scene setter that just introduces the topics for today a little bit more. Uh, we've heard a great introduction already uh, that provides some really concrete examples of, of where we're uh, going to discuss this important topic of consumption-based emissions and looking to try and address this question of how can the EU become a, a leader in consumption-based emissions reduction. So uh, surely I'll uh, introduce uh, three speakers to bring us the European Union perspective. So we're lucky to have representatives from DG Environment, from Joint Research Centre and from the European Environment Agency. And then we'll turn to uh, look at the member states perspective. And we have uh, speakers from Sweden, Denmark and France. And uh, following that, we'll have a chance uh, for everyone to uh, have, be involved in an open discussion. And uh, please uh, save your questions and reflections for that session, and we'll have a, a really good uh, open discussion, I hope. Uh, at the end, uh, we'll be uh, asking uh, Per Holmgren to uh, conclude uh, with some remarks to sum up the day. So I'll just move to setting the scene. So to... Uh, 
look at the global emissions trajectory over the period 1990 to 2022, you can see that there has been an increase of 63% over that period of time. And these emissions uh, don't include land use, uh, just so you know. Uh, the EU 27 member states has seen over the same period a decline around 29%. Uh, but this only tells part of the story, as we've heard. Uh, there's uh, the emissions that are embodied in trade are not actually included in this picture. Here you have a chart that shows those emissions that are embodied in trade. And uh, the red countries, and you'll see most of the EU member states are included in that category, have net uh, are net importers of greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that the emissions associated with their imports are higher than the emissions associated with their exports. So if you would uh, cast your mind back to the previous slide, the emissions that you see there do not include that net import. So the ones that uh, the EU is actually responsible for are higher than what we saw in the territorial only emissions. So the project that we at the Stockholm Environment Institute have been uh, initiating with uh, partners is uh, the aim of it is to uh, try to bring consumption-based emissions further onto uh, the European agenda, uh, share some experiences of, of where there has been uh, some approaches already adopted in the EU and also in member states, and to understand some of the hotspots, the consumption areas, but also the countries where the imports uh, to the EU are coming, and to uh, use this information to identify gaps and uh, looking at policy, strategy, monitoring, and targets uh, there. Uh, the focus really is on greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, as MEP Mathieu mentioned, there is also other uh, environmental pressures that are caused by our consumption. Uh, for example, uh, water use and uh, biodiversity pressures, which uh, we don't cover in this project, but uh, they're also very important aspects uh, that I think will come up in a, as we go through the presentations of today. So we're in the early stages of this project. As you can see, uh, January 2024 is the round table of today. Uh, we've gone through a process of interviews with uh, experts, both in member states and the EU and we'll be uh, coming forward with uh, reports and findings from that. But this event today is really important to gather uh, additional perspectives and, and share some lessons that we know uh, from our own experiences. So we're really looking forward to incorporating that as we go forward in the project. So that concludes this uh, introductory uh, setting the scene presentation. The next uh, presentations will be from the EU perspective. And uh, I'd first of all like to invite uh, Barbara Bacigalupi to uh, give us a, a perspective from DG Environment. Welcome. Thank you. It's, uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to say that it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the uh, need uh, to uh, address the consumption-based emissions. I would like to thank uh, uh, Par Holmgren and Sarah Mathieu for hosting the event, uh, but also the organizer, the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, and the Institute for Environment, uh, <coughs> Environment uh, European Policy. In view of answering uh, the questions uh, why uh, consumption-based emissions uh, matter, I, want, I would like to first uh, present shortly the policy context of the uh, EU policy, the, some EU initiatives uh, showing clearly the interest uh, of uh, addressing consumption-based, and uh, I will provide you some uh, uh, examples about uh, how the Commission is using uh, footprint indicators uh, to address the spillovers uh, uh, in monitoring uh, progress. Uh, the European Green Deal uh, is uh, uh, recognizing the big role of uh, addressing uh, um, 
uh, addressing uh, climate uh, and environmental uh, objectives uh, in the EU and globally. Uh, the Eight Environmental Action Program uh, emphasizes uh, the role uh, of addressing uh, consumption-based uh, uh, policies. The Circular Economy Action Plan uh, also includes uh, uh, clear references uh, to uh, decreasing uh, material and consumption footprint uh, and is uh, one of the key elements of the European Green Deal. And uh, uh, re in relation to SDGs, uh, uh, the EU is uh, quite committed uh, to deliver SDGs uh, and uh, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in the EU and helping uh, uh, the external dimension, so helping other countries uh, to deliver. The European Green Deal uh, is uh, the first uh, Commission priority and uh, it aims at uh, uh, ensuring uh, a sustainable growth, uh, climate neutrality and a resource efficient uh, Europe. It builds uh, on uh, uh, a series uh, of uh, environmental policies uh, and uh, of uh, sectoral policies uh, which uh, helps uh, achieving these systemic changes uh, that, yeah, that is so fundamental to achieving uh, the European Green Deal ambitions. At global uh, resource, at global level, uh, this was already uh, said, uh, resource extraction and processing are responsible for more than half uh, of uh, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, uh, it is clear that cutting uh, greenhouse gas emissions and reducing a primary material use uh, are the two sides of the same coin. We cannot achieve uh, one if we do not achieve the other objective. And in achieving the European Green Deal, uh, the EU needs to act as a, as a global leader <clears throat> because uh, global challenges uh, of the triple climate of the triple planetary crisis require a global response. One of the pillars of the European Green Deal is to ensure that the EU act as a global leader, in particular with diplomacy, with trade policy, with development support and other policies, including international agreements like the Conference of Parties on Climate Change, the one on biodiversity and the one on desertification. The Eight Environmental Action Program is one important tool to ensure a good governance of the European Green Deal within the, the, this Commission mandate, but also beyond. Why? Because the ATP has a, a longer term vision to achieve uh, the six priority objectives by 2030 with a 2050 vision of living well within the planetary boundaries. While the ATP has a similar objectives of the European Green Deal, uh, it is uh, a decision. So it is uh, a formal act that uh, commits uh, not only the Commission, but it commits the European Parliament, uh, the Council, all member states, uh, the, European the European Social and Economic Committee and the Committee of the Regions. One of the objectives of the ATP is uh, to significantly decrease uh, the union material and consumption footprint uh, to bring them into the planetary boundaries uh, as soon as possible. In addition, uh, it also recognizes uh, as uh, enablers uh, of the achievement uh, the global uptake uh, of the priority objectives, uh, supporting uh, by ensuring coherence between uh, internal and external approaches, in particular by fostering sustainable corporate governance, including establishing mandatory due diligence requirements at union level and promoting the uptake at responsible, of responsible business conduct in union external policies, including trade policy. The Circular Economy Action Plan emphasizes again this objective of, uh, um, of uh, reducing material footprint. The circular economy aims uh, to keep the value of materials uh, in the economy, and in this way it allows uh, to decrease pressures on primary resource use. The aspirational objective of the circular economy is uh, to keep 
EU resource consumption within the planetary boundaries and therefore strive to reduce its consumption footprint. This is an aspirational objective because the circular economy action plan is a communication and it's not, it's, it has not been formally adopted by Council and Parliament. Uh, and again, uh, the, in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, these uh, are at the core of the EU policy. Uh, leave no one behind uh, is really very close uh, to the, and it's clearly embedded in the SDGs uh, and the, in the European Green Deal. And uh, um, more recently, in uh, 2023, uh, the EU adopted the, uh, the first uh, SDG voluntary review, where the, EU pres the Commission presents uh, the um, efforts uh, to reduce, uh, <coughs> to, to achieve uh, SDGs uh, both uh, at internal, uh, both uh, at uh, uh, external, uh, bo both boosting the external dimension, so helping other countries uh, to achieving uh, SDGs. Uh. Now, let me just uh, give you a few examples of the key, some key initiatives uh, which uh, address environmental spillovers. Uh, um, the new carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, this has been already mentioned uh, uh, as a, one of the key examples to embed uh, uh, sustainability in the products that uh, are uh, used in the internal market. Uh, the, in October 2023, the transitional phase is started. That means that now uh, we certain goods uh, are uh, uh, needs to um, compile comply with this uh, mechanism. In particular, the first sectors uh, include the products like cement, iron, and steel, aluminium, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. Another uh, important initiative uh, is the regulation on deforestation, uh, which uh, was, ado has adopted, uh, was adopted in 2023 and it came into force in June. And uh, with this uh, regulation, uh, uh, we aim to guarantee that the products uh, EU citizens consume do not contribute to deforestation and forest uh, degradation worldwide. And uh, uh, finally, uh, last but not least, uh, the Eco Design for Sustainable Product Regulation, which will allow to shift uh, towards uh, a, a truly um, sustainable products, uh, which are uh, uh, which are made uh, in view that they are they last longer, they use uh, energy and resources uh, more efficiently, they are easier to repair and recycle. They contain fewer substances of concern and include more recycled content. But I would also, I would also like to stress uh, that uh, beyond uh, environment and climate uh, impacts, uh, the, the overexploitation of natural resources uh, are also do also have an impact uh, on human rights, uh, peace, uh, and security. Under this corporate social responsibility, the Commission adopted the key proposals to address uh, also social spillovers. And here I, I mentioned just a few of these initiatives. The Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence, the Regulation on Prohibition uh, on Prohibiting uh, Products Made uh, with Forced Labour on the Union Market, and the revised regulation on conflict minerals. These uh, initiatives are uh, particularly important. In particular, uh, the last one uh, is uh, crucial to ensure that uh, the extraction of uh, uh, critical raw materials uh, uh, for which the digital transition depends uh, are extracted in a way that uh, they do not undermine uh, uh, social uh, um, uh, objectives in other countries. Now, uh, let me go to the first, to the last part of the presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, present you briefly some uh, footprint indicators uh, that have been developed by the European Commission. <clears throat> what, are, what is a footprint? Uh, first of all, uh, a footprint indicator is an indicator which, is, uh, which embeds a, a consumption perspective uh, uh, vision. That means uh, that it considers uh, the impact uh, 
of uh, uh, EU consumption. That means that it also takes into account the um, impact uh, coming from imported goods from abroad. This is a nutshell of the uh, footprint indicator that uh, have been uh, produced by the Commission. Uh, the material footprint uh, looks uh, has a, spo a special focus on uh, on materials, uh, and it considers uh, <clears throat> the amount of materials needed for EU consumption, and it is produced by Eurostat. The consumption footprint uh, estimates uh, the environmental impacts of uh, EU consumption, uh, and it is produced by the Joint Research Center. And Esther will tell you more about this. The carbon footprint, uh, which is produced by Eurostat, uh, <clears throat> and uh, which is which estimates uh, the carbon dioxide uh, dioxide emissions that occur throughout the global production chain of a product that arrives in the respective country, and the land footprint, uh, which uh, has been uh, developed jointly by Eurostat and the Joint Research Center, and which refers to the amount of land. Uh, directly and indirectly needed to, to, to fulfill the consumption of a country. All these indicators are, uh, uh, are produced by the Commission and some of them are uh, used for policy monitoring. Overall, uh, uh, as you can see uh, from the slide, uh, uh, some indicators, uh, many of these indicators uh, are uh, used, some are used specifically for monitoring progress uh, on the eight environmental action program, uh, on the circular economy, on uh, SDGs, uh, and uh, on uh, the resilience dashboard. You will include, uh, you will see in the presentation, I have kept the hyperlinks so you can uh, uh, get more information about this. Uh, very shortly, the material footprint shows uh, uh, a, a decreasing trend. Uh, in the EU and in 2022, uh, figures from Eurostat uh, um, uh, says that uh, in Europe, uh, at, at, uh, on average, uh, the EU consume 14.8 tons per capita, which is uh, approximately overall 6.6 uh, .6 billion tons for the EU as a whole. <clears throat> The, the trend shows uh, two low values, uh, one in 2007, 2018, uh, due to the global financial crisis, uh, and the other one in, is in 2020 due to the COVID-2019 pandemic. If we consider your material footprint vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world, uh, the raw material consumption, the material footprint represents roughly 6.4% of worldwide material extraction. On the consumption footprint, we, also, we see on the opposite side uh, a, an increased trend during 2010 and 2021. So basically during the last 20 years, uh, uh, figures show uh, a deterioration. So we impact more uh, the, the, the planet. In particular, according to the GRC estimates, uh, the EU has clearly transgressed uh, the planetary boundaries for five impacts, uh, which are the particulate matter, ecotoxicity in fresh water, climate change, use of fossil-based resources, uh, and use of mineral and metal resources. And consumption of food is emerging as one of the main drivers of impacts generated by the average EU citizen. Finally, I will, uh, this is a chart uh, which, which builds on uh, Eurostat data. Uh, it's called the carbon footprint, but is, uh, it only uh, presents CO2, carbon dioxide emissions. So it neglects uh, the other greenhouse gas emissions. The chart uh, clearly presents uh, uh, two indicators, uh, the two indicators on CO2 emissions, uh, the one uh, on uh, following uh, the production based, uh, and the other one is on the consumption based. As you can see, for both indicators, uh, the U has decreased uh, the emissions. Uh, uh, overall, uh, however, the, um, the U consumption uh, 
caused uh, 3.2 billion tons of global CO2 emissions, which is around uh, 9% of worldwide CO2 emissions, which is uh, more than uh, uh, if we look at the production-based indicator, according to which uh, we have uh, uh, produced 2.8 billion tons of CO2, which represents uh, around 8% of worldwide CO2 emissions. So these are the figures for 2020. So these are a few key messages from the indicators that I have uh, just uh, presented. Uh, I will not go through because I think we, we don't have much time, but uh, you have the the presentation with you. And final slide uh, it shows uh, uh, in a nutshell uh, how uh, the Commission is using a material footprint uh, and consumption footprint indicators uh, for monitoring progress uh, towards uh, the different uh, policies. Uh, so the ATP, the Environmental Action Program, uh, Circular Economy, uh, SDGs uh, and uh, Resilience. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Barbara. I'd like to now uh, pass uh, to Janes Bakas uh, to no, Esther. Is it Esther, Esther. Sonia Miguel Ningual. Yes. Oh, no. Is it uh, Esther first? Yes. Yeah, I think. Okay. <laughs> And in any case, the three of us will talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to reiterate the, the thank you from, from the John Reset Center to, to the organizers and the MEPs for, for this event and for inviting us. I will talk about uh, consumption-based emissions and, and how they can support EU policies and the work that the John Reset Center has been doing. So first, I, I wanted to highlight the relevance and the importance to have a supply chain perspective. Any product that we consume requires uh, a series of uh, steps, which are the, the life cycle of the product, like you can see here from the design, the extraction of the materials, then the manufacturing, transport, until we consume them. And at the end of their life, they might go to disposal or to alternative circular economy pathways. In each of these uh, steps, there is a consumption of resources and there are substances and waste emitted to the environment. And some of the part of the supply chain doesn't occur inside the territory of the EU. So the important question here is how we can account for those impacts that we are responsible for as consumers, but that are happening in third countries. So for this purpose at the Jersey, we developed a framework to assess and compare both territorial and consumption impacts. It includes two different indicators. And in the first part, we concentrate the efforts in what happens within the EU in what's called the domestic activities of production and consumption. And based on official statistics, one can uh, collect information and assess the impacts due to the resource extraction and the emissions. And this is done in the domestic footprint indicator. But as we were commenting, you know, for uh, not all what we produce, we consume in, in the territory domestically, but we need to import from third countries, raw materials, intermediary products or final products, as well as part of EU production is exported to third countries. So when we focus on the impacts of consumption, we need to consider these three elements, the production element and the trade balance between imports and exports. And this is what we do in the consumption footprint indicator where we consider these uh, three elements. This indicator is based on life cycle assessment, so it considers the entire supply chain. We assess the 16 impact categories of the environmental footprint, which is the method recommended by the Commission for life cycle assessments. And this allows us to assess beyond climate change and be able to identify and potentially prevent trade-offs that might occur between environmental issues. And as well, it offers us a high granularity for supporting policy development like Analysis, uh, the analysis of different uh, scenarios. 
So if we pay attention to uh, the data since 2010, we observe what we have been uh, discussing so far. The domestic footprint shows a continuous decrease. This is the effect of the implementation of EU environmental policy, and it shows an absolute decoupling from the economic growth, here shown in terms of gross domestic product. But when we observe the evolution of the consumption footprint, the trend is different. It shows rather a stability or a slight increase. So here the decoupling from the economic growth is only relative. And here we can clearly see this gap that we were uh, commenting. The trade balance and the import impacts are higher than those of the exports. So we are externalizing impacts to third countries. If we evaluate the, the trend and the decoupling of the consumption footprint, we are still showing some relative decoupling, which is something positive, but still we need further efforts. Since if we assess it from an absolute sustainability perspective, like Barbara was showing, we can compare the consumption footprint against the planetary boundaries, which are science-based limits of the planet. And unfortunately, current data shows that we are transgressing many of them. So we need to work further on both domestically and considering also the trade balance. It is important that uh, when we evaluate the consumption footprint, we also go beyond climate change. In here, you can see the 16 impact categories of the environmental footprint and how the five areas of consumption included in this indicator contribute to them. And you see that there are some impact categories for which in green, food consumption is the major contributor mainly related to aspects of emissions during agricultural practices, for example, while other impact categories, it's the blue, uh, here the housing, and are related to impacts due to the consumption of energy. So it's important to understand that depending how consumption patterns change in the different areas of consumption might have a different effect depending on the impact that we are evaluating. And on this aspect, I wanted to show you an example. We evaluated different green transitions within the consumption of household appliances. And compared to the baseline, the current consumption, we can observe here the results of the 16 impact categories. And we evaluated eco-efficiency measures, benefits of circularity like recycling and technological change like improving the impacts of the electricity mix and all of them showed benefits in all the impact categories but when we evaluated the behavioral change and increase of the consumption of these appliances, we observed that this would offset in most of the cases the benefits of the other uh, scenarios that we were evaluating and it will show even trade-offs in a specific impact categories as you can see here in orange. The consumption footprint can support policy development in three main areas. As Barbara has shown, it can support monitoring or observing evolution over time, a specific analysis like uh, the decoupling or focusing on the SDGs. We can support policy making identifying the hotspots where the environmental impacts are coming from, so where we need to act. And the assessment against the planetary boundaries can also support this type of analysis. We can compare domestic and consumption impacts or focus on a specific aspect like biodiversity or the SDGs. And finally, as you saw, you saw the example, we can test a scenarios both uh, regarding behavioral change or consumption pattern change or technological developments like green transitions. We can see already examples of this type of support. As you saw uh, in Barbara's presentation, the consumption footprint is already included in different monitoring frameworks of the European Green Deal. Regarding hotspot identification, we can use this uh, indicator in the impact assessment of policies to understand what the policy scenarios and the goals of the policy should focus on. And the same for testing scenarios. We can support impact assessment when preparing policies, as well as support outlook exercises for the future, like the one for the zero pollution action plan. 
And just uh, one of the last points, if we move to the national level, we do have data in the consumption footprint platform for both the EU and the EU countries, and this is accessible and downloadable for any stakeholder. And we recently developed a specific tool to allow the customization of the consumption footprint data. This is the member states consumption footprint tool and member states or stakeholders can access, access the consumption data that we employ and test alternative values of consumption and recalculate and download also the resulting consumption footprint. And this resulted from a pilot study that we did with Germany, where we published a joint study and we did exactly this, compare our data from the GRC that it's available from EU-wide uh, data sources like Eurostat with alternative national data sources like could be consumer surveys. And some uh, concluding remarks, the consumption footprint is being used in multiple monitoring frameworks of the commission and this supports coherence across policies. The data that we use are mainly based on official uh, production and consumption statistics regarding the consumption element and we combine it with environmental modeling based on life cycle assessment. And we have observed some challenges. We have observed some data quality issues regarding outliers or gaps in these statistics of production and consumption. So for the purpose of making targets and making something mandatory, that would require joint efforts between the member states and institutions to improve quality. Some opportunities that we identify are, for example, the member state tool could be employed to test these alternative data sources that could be employed. And the science-based uh, planetary boundaries could support uh, the definition of consumption footprint targets. And finally, this model shows certain advantages compared to other options like the alignment with environmental footprint method. So here you have uh, the list of the latest reports. I think it doesn't work. With the, the link uh, to the website of the project and you can access all the material. And for one of them, I have here some hard copies in case any of you want one. Thank you so much for Thank you so much, Esther from Joint Research Center. And now, uh, Janus Bakas uh, from the European yeah, Environment right Agency. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot also from my part for inviting us here. Um, I will be speaking about the EA perspectives on obviously the same topic, using the same evidence base as the previous two speakers. So thanks a lot. You saved me a little bit of time to explain the consumption footprint and all that. Um, waiting for the slides to appear, right? Yeah. Okay, while we were waiting, maybe I should... Uh, I remember the first one, so I'll start speaking. Um, so I, I, I thought I'd start by reiterating the difference between territorial and uh, consumption-based emissions, especially looking into the policy relevance of each so the territorial-based emissions is, if you can imagine, a huge net ab above the EU territory, and whatever comes into that net, that's the territorial emissions. On the other hand, the consumption-based emissions are, are more or less related to economic terms. So the EU consumption, uh, we want to spend our money, and, we want, and with that, we create demand for products, material, services. And because we do that, processes, uh, in the EU, but also elsewhere in the world, start to happen so that the demand that we create is fulfilled. Yeah? These are the consumption-based emissions. Uh, they are both very relevant for policymaking. The territorial-based emissions are the ones that we can directly control, directly, that's the key word here, uh, because we can make targets, we can uh, put filters above our, the, the industrial facilities in the, in the EU and so on and so forth. The consumption-based emissions, the ones that take place outside the EU borders, we can 
indirectly influenced. And Barbara, thanks a lot for that. You, you, you outlined a lot of, uh, or a few examples uh, on how this can happen in deforestation, regulation, and so on and so forth. But only indirectly. Yeah? Um, ah, there you go. That's the slide I've been speaking on, I think. Yes. Uh, so both of them are, are relevant for policymakers. And what uh, my point is that you should take into account both side by side if you want to make really good decisions about the environment. You cannot ignore, you cannot only focus on the territorial and because you might run the risk that you're outsourcing uh, impacts outside the EU. Yeah? Um, so the, uh, the, the rest of my presentation will revolve around four key questions. How are we doing? when it comes to EU consumption and the environment, the implications on the environment. Are we doing well? Why is it that we see the developments that we see? I think that's a really key uh, question to reflect on. And then, of course, we have to be constructive. What can we do about it? What can we do about the developments we see? Um, this is, again, the consumption footprint. It is very similar results to what Esther showed you before, so I will not go into the details of defining that. This comes from a, a little bit of a different methodology than what Esther presented to you, but it's exactly the same, uh, I think, key messages you see. It's more or less stable, slightly, 2021 is slightly above 2010, so stability, maybe even a little bit of increase in the EU consumption footprint. And this is the answer to how are we doing. But are we doing well? I think that's a more uh, deep question. Uh, so. Uh, the, the previous speakers spoke about the long-term ambition of environmentalists to decouple um, consumption-based impacts from economic growth. So that means you let the economy grow in the EU, but the um, uh, environmental impacts associated with that decrease with time. And that is the decoupling. The HCAP, as Barbara explained, went even further and said that we need to significantly reduce our consumption footprint. And here you can very clearly see that uh, uh, we are in fact decoupling because the economy, I don't have, uh, I think um, Esther showed that before, the economy is, show, is, is growing much more than the environmental impacts associated with our consumption, but we're definitely not significantly reducing the consumption footprint. That's also very clear. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make, you cannot see in the graph, but if you look into the numbers behind it, that 53% of the impacts of the consumption-based impacts are happening outside the EU. Let me repeat that. The majority of impacts that we are causing on the environment are happening outside the EU borders. So that, that probably tells us that there is a, there's a very significant part of that is somehow under our responsibility of environmental impacts that's happening outside our, our direct control in the EU. That was, are we doing well? Um, also, you can get results like that uh, across uh, the different member states. There's large differences across the, the different countries. Uh, but there is one rule of thumb that the, the more affluent, the richer one country is, the more the uh, environmental, not the consumption footprint that it has. And that uh, leads me to the next slide, where we look into the main drivers. What, what is it that uh, makes the trends develop of the consumption footprint the way they do. We have done analysis on that at the EA, and our conclusions point to two major drivers. Uh, they are drivers that are uh, um, pointing to exactly different directions. One is improvements in production efficiency. So this has to do with things like we are greening the production of products here in the EU because we're decarbonizing the energy grid, for instance. Um, or we are making more with less. We are becoming more resource efficient in, uh, in our production. Uh, or we're just putting some filters to capture PM particles leaving the stacks of the EU uh, industrial facilities. And that uh, obviously is driving consumption footprint down because we become more efficient, more environmental uh, efficient in, our, in the way we produce things. Also elsewhere outside the EU, there are efforts to decarbonize and so on. Eh? Uh, on the other hand, we're becoming richer, so we have more money, so we have more uh, higher consumption expenditure with time. So we're buying more stuff, more goods, more services, and so on. And therefore, we will we increase our consumption footprint because we are becoming more affluent. And you can see here, it, it doesn't matter to look into the different uh, segments, uh, time periods in the in the graph. 
but the the idea is that we are becoming more affluent and therefore this it tilts the, the development of the consumption footprint upwards. And then the, the fact that we're becoming more efficient in our production it holds it down. And that's why you see more or less a stability in the consumption footprint. What, what is also a, a good a question that has been uh, hanging around environmentalists for long is that is the production improvements, the, the, are the production improvements enough uh, to deliver the significant uh, reduction in the consumption footprint that is called for in the 8th EAP and elsewhere? And in the data that we have so far, maybe in the future this changes, is that it's not really enough uh, so far, at least, uh, to keep in investing in improving our production uh, processes because they cannot deliver this significant uh, reduction, so far at least. Um, I've been speaking a lot about trends uh, and if, there, if things are going well or not so far in terms of uh, a time period between 2010 and 2021. But I think what's important is, regardless of the trends, maybe it, the, some years the consumption footprint increases, some years it decreases, but it's absolute value, and Esther explained that well, it's absolute value leads to environmental impacts that are uh, transgressing a lot of the planetary boundaries. So that means that regardless of the trends, we are our consumption-based impacts are too high right now. And if we are to, uh, to, to live within the planetary boundaries, as the 8th AP calls for, the Environmental Action Program, then we, we need to act now. In, at the EA, we have developed this triptych about actions that we can do to bring our consumption-based impacts down around reduce, shift, and improve. Reduce has to do with, uh, uh, for instance, using products that live longer. And that is uh, also an objective of the ESPR that is currently discussed. Uh, so if we have products that last longer, then we reduce the need to buy, to replace them uh, as often as we do today. Shift, shift to less material intensive options. The way we span, spend our money matters. So if we spend our money as consumers into a, a, a material intensive products instead of, for instance, going to the movies, then we, we are generating higher environmental impacts. And then improve. Uh, I showed in the previous slide that the effect of improving our production networks matters. It is the, the driver that holds our consumption-based impacts uh, to stability so far. So we, we need to keep on with that because it actually, uh, it actually works. So we shouldn't neglect that. Yeah? And that's it for me. I hope I gave you a little bit of food for thought with the presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Yanis, and uh, everyone for providing the perspective from the European Union and uh, how it looks uh, from a regional perspective. We'll now move uh, to a member state uh, point of view and uh, look at uh, three case study countries that we're covering in this project. And I'd first like to invite Katharina Axelsson from Stockholm Environment Institute to uh, speak to us about the Swedish case. Katharina is the project leader for the project that sits behind this, so my colleague uh, in the project and at SEI. Thank you, Tim. Yes, yeah, so I will give you a brief introduction to Sweden's work to monitor consumption-based emissions. Just waiting for the slides. Maybe I can just continue speaking. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to, oh, here, here we go. To start, oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I think here we go, yeah. So already some 25 years ago, uh, in 1999, Sweden adopted the generational goal 
that says that the overarching goal with Sweden's environmental policy work is to hand over to the next generation a society in which the major environmental problems in Sweden have been solved without causing increased environmental and health problems outside Sweden's borders. So this goal clearly demonstrates Sweden's recognition of the fact that the way we live and consume in Sweden risk having a negative impact on other countries where goods are being produced to satisfy Swedish demands. Okay, yeah. So, despite the ambitions set by the Swedish generational goal, Sweden is, however, still very far from on the right path to meet long term climate targets, which is often referred to about one ton per person by 2050. Uh, something which is clear from, from this graph that you see here, which show the overall trend with regards to Sweden's consumption based emissions. In the case of Sweden, households are responsible for about 60% of Sweden's total consumption-based emissions, the public sector for 10, and investments, both public and private, for the remaining 30%. So from looking at this graph, it's quite clear that the current policies and measures are not sufficient to influence the consumption patterns and behaviours and curb the emissions at the pace required. Uh, Johanne spoke about 53% being imported uh, in terms of EU uh, on average, in, and in the case of Sweden, around 60% of Sweden's total consumption-based emissions are imported into Sweden. And here you can see the trends since 2008 and how increases as well as decreases are partly influenced by which countries Sweden import from. Statistics Sweden is also monitoring the emission intensities associated with imports from different countries as well as sectors of consumption. I have included four examples here and it's interesting to note how the emission intensity has improved across the board since 2008, which is very positive to see. This, however, also suggests that it can be important to be aware about these differences if we want to sort of contribute to mitigate the global emission levels, while of course also recognizing the importance of supporting countries uh, in the transition to cleaner technologies, etc. So Sweden recently undertook a governmental investigation to understand the opportunities uh, for Sweden to establish a consumption-based target at the national level. All political parties were in agreement to investigate this. But the proposal was unfortunately shelved with the new government formed in 2022. And to my understanding, only two threads are currently active from this proposal, and that is to analyze the climate benefits associated with Swedish exports and to explore how to establish more stringent climate requirements as part of the public procurement. While slow progress to address consumption based emissions can be noted from the Swedish national level, we we note uh, promising initiatives and work at the Swedish local level. Uh, from a 2018 survey, we learned that already around 25% of the Swedish municipalities that responded to this uh, survey uh, had a consumption-based target of some kind in place. And we also learned that political support was what the respondents uh, said they needed the most in order to be able to further advance the work and then followed by financial uh, support. And I want to conclude by pointing to the tool, the consumption compass, 
which is able to estimate consumption-based emissions down to the postcode level and is meant to be used as support for municipalities to tailor policies and measures to address differences and similarities in households' consumption patterns. And we are very happy to note that this tool has been quick picked up by quite many municipalities already, and that we have come to understand that many use it in support of their work to address just and sustainable transition to a climate smart society. And this, I think, sends us a very strong signal that this is something that municipalities consider to be a priority and that they want to contribute to this work. That was all from me on the Swedish case. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. And uh, we'll turn now to uh, Denmark. And online, we have uh, Michael Minter, who will present from Concito. And uh, he is online, I can see. Very good. And your presentation is... Should I yeah. share myself or will you... you... You should be able to share it yourself if you, if you so. can from there. So... Not possible. Actually, it looks like we can from here as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then you have to help me. We, we can see the slides. Yes. If you could speak up a little bit, Michael, so that we can All make right. sure we hear you well. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Well, thanks for the invitation for this event and um, uh, in, the, in this short time I have here, I will uh, go ahead and uh, say a few words about Conciso. We are Denmark's green think tank, uh, established in 2008, and we are working on uh, the uh, climate transformation, mainly of uh, all the economic sectors and our consumption habits, and uh, of course, with a view of uh, other sustainability parameters as well. And then. Consensus program on food and consumption. We work on both the production and consumption side of the food system and the transformation of that. But we also work more in general with uh, promoting climate friendly and sustainable consumption patterns and uh, lifestyle. That's included in our programmatic efforts. So next slide, please. Yes, the policy status uh, in Denmark on consumption-based emissions is that we got the Danish Climate Act adopted in 2020. Uh, it includes a 70% reduction target on uh, the territorial emissions compared to 1990 and uh, an objective of a climate neutral society by 2050 at the latest, and uh, that was uh, changed to uh, 2045 in the present government platform. Uh, there's a guiding principle in the Climate Act saying that uh, Danish measures uh, should not simply relocate all the greenhouse gases emissions to outside Denmark's borders, so uh, there you address the consumption emissions. And uh, there's also a requirement to do an annual climate status with a global report on the international effects of the Danish climate effort. Uh, so that's the Climate Act. In, in the present government platform, uh, they have a, uh, an ambition to look at the uh, export of energy technology and services and uh, the positive global impact of that. Uh, they also have ambitions on public 
procurement, but on the question of uh, the carbon footprint of our consumption, they only have the ambition to examine the consequences of setting a target. So, so that's a very soft wording there. And um, there's not much going on at the national level com considering the, the consumption emissions at the moment. Uh, so that's the status. Next slide, please. The official data on uh, consumption-based emissions in, in Denmark, this is from uh, this annual global report from the Danish Energy Authority, shows that uh, also comparable to the European trend that uh, almost half of our emissions are abroad. And uh, you can also see that the reduction in, in the global uh, consumption emissions are uh, mainly in, in Denmark uh, due to uh, uh, the transformation of the, the energy system, but the, the global emissions are basically unchanged uh, over time. Um, so uh, we, we have to deal with that. And this, it was also said before that this is kind of shifting uh, part of uh, the, the reduction to, to, to other uh, countries in the world. And that, in, in our point of view, in Concito, contradicts with the guiding principle of the Climate Act that it must, must be ensured that uh, the Danish measures do not simply move the greenhouse gas emissions uh, outside the borders. And uh, that is kind of the case here. Next slide. Yes, this um, issue of consumption-based emissions has been a focus area for Consensus since 2010. And uh, we have had a national result of uh, 17 to 19 ton per uh, capita uh, since 2010. We updated this uh, data and report uh, last year and then this report from August showing that uh, the emissions today is uh, 13 tons per capita. Um, that's a reduction compared to before, but much of this reduction uh, can be explained by uh, methodolog methodological uh, changes, but also uh, <coughs> um, different uh, measuring of uh, the climate impact of biomass and so on, for instance. So um, yeah, the footprint shows you the distribution of the footprint in, in sectors or activities. And uh, the circle in the, in the bottom shows you that this is not um, 13 tons per uh, capita equally shared, there's a distribution uh, that is connected to uh, economic distribution and consumption patterns. And uh, we, we did these calculations showing that if, if you have a low income and a very climate uh, friendly way of living, you could uh, reduce to below nine tons um, per person, and uh, if you have a high income and a, an unfriendly, climate friendly way of living, you could uh, be on 25 ton per person or be beyond that. So, there's a, an important distributional aspect there as well. Uh, considering uh, reduction targets, we uh, looking at the, the global trends, we, we need to see a uh, a uh, reduction of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions by half in the coming de decade or so. So uh, we also say that this could could be a relevant uh, Danish reduction target for consumption-based emissions. So that would require a uh, a uh, reduction by by half in uh, from 2020 to 2030 in in our recommendations. Uh, and also, if you see the <clears throat> uh, 
The global average today is around six tons per capita, and uh, according to the IPCC um, climate budgets and uh, and uh, scenarios, there we should be at three tons per capita by 2030. So that's a major challenge to to reach this, and uh, also considering, uh, yeah. The, the, the global distribution, we, we would argue that uh, rich countries should more than half the uh, consumption footprints uh, by the, in the next decade. But uh, yeah, we, we also need to, to start somewhere with a uh, politically relevant uh, um, ambition. So, so that's uh, the, the recommendations from Concito and um, Next slide. Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, that's the Denmark perspective. And uh, we'll now turn back to the room, uh, Cesar Dugard, to uh, take us through the uh, perspective from France. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm going to uh, present a few elements on the French uh, carbon footprint. And thank you very much uh, for SEI for um, uh, letting us work with you. So I'm with uh, Carbon4, a French uh, consultancy that uh, helps um, companies, but also policymakers, NGOs, and um, the general public uh, do the right assessments and uh, take the right decisions. So uh, what can we say about the um, French consumption-based emissions? Um, so is it working? Yes. <clears throat> so what you can see is that uh, French national footprint is currently at zero, which is very good news, right? <laughs> no, actually, we're going to do step by step. So what can we find in the national footprint and the national inventory of France? So as was was already said by Esther, at the EU level, we start with the same or almost the same package, which is the direct emissions of the territory, uh, either from household emissions or from domestic production, excluding exports. And then when you want to calculate the French national footprint, you have to add emissions from imports, either for final use or for intermediate consumption. So what you can see first is that half of the French uh, consumption-based emissions are imported. If you want to uh, calculate the national inventory, you have to include what we could produce inside of our territory, but what we export as well. So more than half of um, our emissions are imported, and domestic emissions are slightly lower than the carbon footprint with 423 million tons of CO2 per year. So if you look at the trend uh, um, across uh, the different, uh, the, the latest years, you can see um, a slight, let's say a slight decrease because we, we have decreased in absolute terms our uh, consumption-based emissions, our carbon footprint by 7% since 1995. But what's interesting is that you have, as uh, Ioan has said at EU level, two different um, trends inside this. When you look at the, 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 the bars, uh, the blue bars, you have the light blue, which is the domestic emissions, and the um, dark blue, which are the imports. When you look at the light blue, it is slightly decreasing. So we have decreased our domestic emissions by 33% since 1995. But at the same time, we have increased our imported emissions by 32% from 1995. So it's really important to, to look at different dynamics uh, behind uh, the decrease of uh, carbon uh, consumption-based emissions. And when you look at the graph, you can also see red dots, which is the intensity per capita. Uh, now we are at 9.2 tons of CO2 uh, equivalent per capita, which is uh, too high. We have to be around two tons of CO2 per capita in 2050 if we want to become carbon neutral. Uh, but good news is that these uh, emissions per capita have decreased by almost 20% compared 
1995, but we have experienced a growth in the, the last uh, year. When you break down um, the carbon footprint uh, by different consumption categories, it's really interesting because you can see that transport accounts for one third of our average uh, French individual carbon footprint, half of which is also imported. And when you look at transport, housing, and food all together, those, just those three represent uh, three quarters, 75% of the total carbon footprint. So imported emissions in those different uh, consumption categories are really um, significant in the appliances and other services emissions. But you also have a minority of imports in the housing emissions. Of course, you also have emissions uh, related to public services in France. And then to just finish on um, uh, recommendations that the High Council for Climate, HCC, uh, have uh, been uh, doing for, to tackle France's carbon footprint, they have, um, well, recommended three areas, three avenues for action. The first is to improve monitoring of the emissions related to international exchanges. The good news is that starting from this year, the French administration has switched from a SRIO model to an MRIO model to, to calculate the carbon footprint. So for those who do not know what it means, it's really normal uh, because I really discovered uh, this like uh, two months ago. But actually it means that the calculation is going to become more precise more accurate and with much more detail on importation uh, countries and so on. Second recommendation is to adapt um, the existing setup, inform demand and oversee trade and support global ambition. And the third recommendation of the High Council for Climate is to reduce, to, 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 to reduce uh, in line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And we also have good news here this year because the new version of the French climate strategy, the national climate strategy that is going to be uh, updated and published this year, is going to include a target on a uh, carbon footprint. I think it's gonna be a 65% reduction from 2005 until uh, 2050. So pretty good news. We, we are uh, about to have a direction on this, uh, but there is still lots to be done to effectively uh, reduce our carbon footprint. That was it for France. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar. And good to end on some uh, good news from uh, one of the member states. Uh, so that uh, concludes our overview of the, the three uh, member state case studies. And now I'm glad to say uh, I would I'd like to hand to my colleague Antoine Auger, who's from the Institute for European Environmental Policy, one of our uh, co-hosts today. And uh, Antoine will uh, do some, uh, some presentations on the policy opportunities and also take us through to moderate the open discussion. So very shortly, prepare your questions and uh, comments so that we can have that open discussion very soon. Thank you so much, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. So um, as a way of an introduction, I had um, a somewhat lengthy presentation on the current stage of where we are at and so on. But I think everything we've heard from the EU level, from the member states, are, is relatively clear is that at the moment, our current sustainability crisis is driven by domestic action, yes, very much, but also impacted by activities that extend beyond our borders. This happens mostly through trade, but not only, if I were to mention, we should also mention the unfair tax competitions, uh, tax havens, shifted profits of multinationals, and other financial um, aspects. That's not from me, that's from the EU Sustainable Development Report, which is an annual publication that the IEP has been contributing uh, to, and which also confirms what we've heard this morning, that in, through this international spillover index, is that the EU, um, tends to generate large negative external spillover. These are driven primarily by unsustainable supply chains serving the consumption needs of EU countries, and which eventually lead to negative environmental and social impact, such as GSG emissions, deforestation, water stress, and so on. So 
to curb this trade-related negative spillover is not about simply restricting trade. Because, first of all, this is quite necessary for all sustainable development, both in the EU and abroad, especially for developing countries to generate employment and social economic developments. It's a matter of making trade more sustainable and more consistent with our global objectives, whether it's from the Paris Agreement, the Global Biodiversity Framework, the SDGs, and so on. So how do we do that? The classic way to look at this from an EU perspective at the moment is to look through the classic, let's say, multilayer layer trade perspective, the multilateral level, the bilateral level, the autonomous measures. So unfortunately, these first two levels, multilateral and bilateral, are facing a lot of challenges at the moment. The WTO is largely uh, blocked for, di for different reasons. We've had setbacks in the um, agreement of free trade agreements, of bilateral agreements with our partners lately. So the EU has largely reverted to autonomous measures. Some say unilateral. This has created some diplomatic uh, challenges for the EU on the, on the global stage. Yet, it is important to look at this issue holistically, to look at this issue from a value chain perspective, as Esther has mentioned it on, when presenting the GRC model. We need to understand how and what we consume and where the environmental and sustainability impacts of our consumptions are the strongest but also where the value is created along the relevant value chains, so that eventually we can address our consumption-based emissions in the right policy framework and in a just manner for exporting countries, so that we can support them transitioning more towards environmentally sustainable development path. To do that, we have metrics, we have policies, we've heard of them this morning, we've heard about the CBAM, we've heard about the EUDR, we've heard about the eco-design, and uh, due diligence um, legislations. I could speak about them for hours, but I would like to keep the floor open for everyone to, uh, to contribute. So now this objective of this next session is to debate on how best to further integrate the notions of, com of consumption-based emissions in EU policies. I will try to enter the debate, and I would like to ask a few questions to everyone, but of course, I will direct my question to some particular in the speakers of, uh, of today, but by all means, please feel free to reach out to, to take the floor. I wanted to turn first to the policymakers in the room. We have an MEP hosting us. Thanks again for having us today. We have the European Commission, for instance. We also have the member states with us. So, when looking at the policy landscape at the moment, I wanted to ask which policy measures could be introduced to actively, effectively curb consumption-based emissions. But what is missing at the moment when we look at all of the indices indicators that paint a very clear picture? So, and yes, looking particularly at the member states, if you want to further promote your own initiatives and explain us how this could be integrated at the EU level, then by all means, do so. Please, the floor is open. Barbara. Many thanks. Well, first of all, uh, uh, as I have presented uh, this morning, uh, I think that uh, the priority is uh, first to finalize the adoption uh, of the proposals uh, that are now on the table, uh, uh, not last uh, the ESPR, the Regulation for Eco-Designed eco uh, for Sustainable Products, to ensure the enforcement of this legislation and to fully implement on the ground. All this process uh, takes uh, time, it takes probably years, and I would say that uh, it will probably take some time, additional time before the figures uh, that we have uh, on hand uh, can show such a shift. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, of carbon, uh, I am uh, of carbon footprint. I really very much welcome the approach uh, from France, uh, what, what was just presented, uh, because uh, that shows that clearly uh, a consumption-based uh, approach uh, in terms of target can also be complementary to the traditional uh, production-based uh, approach. When it comes to uh, carbon footprint, uh, okay, I cannot uh, speak on behalf of, uh, of uh, DG Climate Action, Director General, so I will stop here, but I, I would just like to reiterate the fact that uh, in, um, in the eighth environmental action program, uh, in the circular economy action plan, uh, we have included uh, this directional target of uh, 
considerably decreasing material footprint uh, because this is uh, not only important for uh, uh, ensuring a sustainable use of resources, uh, but it's also a clear leverage uh, to meet climate neutrality. We cannot just have uh, uh, the package, uh, I mean, the package of uh, Fit for 55 is, of course, crucial, but it's not the only key instrument to meet climate neutrality. The circular economy has a major role. And I think the discussion today has clearly stressed this. Thanks. Well, from my point of view, I think the most important thing is actually to, to always have a better holistic view, no matter what kind of legislation we're working with. Uh, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, I'm in, in the ENVI uh, committee and also in the AGRI committee. And usually when we are negotiating in the environmental committee, uh, we get some sort of agreement and understanding across the different uh, political groups. But where we're in the agricultural sector and trying to, to really implement sustainability in all the legislation uh, discussed in the agri committee, it's very, very tricky, or, or should I say it's impossible, more or less, because we have this compact um, uh, reaction from the more conservative part of the parliament that do not think that that sector is included. It's enough if we do it in, in other uh, sectors. But, but we need to do this all the way through. And of course, not the least when it comes to, to trade agreements with the uh, other uh, parts of, of outside the European Union, we need to make sure that all these trade agreements uh, do include sustainability, both when it comes to ecological measures, but also, of course, when it comes to social measures. So that is something that I've been lacking uh, throughout these, uh, this period of legislation. I hope it will be, be improved during the next, if I'm still here. Thank you. Yeah, a small comment from me. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the policy landscape too much because uh, we don't take part in that as the EA, but we did publish a report two years ago that I thought would be interesting for this discussion. This is about climate-friendly sourcing. And uh, my hat, normal, the normal hat I have on is on a circular economy hat. So we looked at the way both the public and the private sector procure materials from global value chains because we live in a globalized uh, world. Yeah. Uh, so we try to, with this report, to um, underline the potential of procurement to influence what happens elsewhere in the world. So not only the public procurement, which is, of course, a very significant part of things, but also individual companies that, that want to take action. There's a lot of ways that they can influence their suppliers elsewhere in the, from the EU in the way that these suppliers produce the materials they need. Uh, through, for instance, make, making you know conditions in the uh, in, in their procurement practices, uh, contracts, and so on and so forth. So that um, uh, just wanted to make that comment that we we speak a lot about the public sector and rightfully so, of course, but there's also a big part, uh, a, a big potential in a way that lies in the hands of the of the businesses, and we should never ignore that one. Eh? Thank you so much, and. I could, I could not agree more with the, what has been said, if, I, if you allow me to leave my hat of a moderator for just a second, but I hear the new, um, the material footprint in general to be, to be addressed. I hear the taking more holistic view into resource management and so on. I just want to point out that the IEP has just published a report specifically for an EU resource law as a missing piece of the European Green Deal, as a key part, aspect to, to manage to address our, our material footprint. So that should definitely, we feel that this should be a priority for the next uh, legislature. But please, a question here, and then Cesar. Thanks a lot. I'm uh, Stefano Spinacci from the European Parliamentary Research Service. So thanks for the event. I really, I sincerely enjoyed it and uh, there were a lot of food for thought. Uh, first, a, a, a disclaimer, because my question uh, uh, could look like negative, but I have a strong appreciation of what uh, the European Union institutions and also all the, um, let's say, uh, the NGOs and they do on this subject. Uh, but my question is uh, connected to the question that was done uh, by Ioannis, and uh, the question was, how are we doing well? 
Um, and uh, I thought um, how a, a typical consumer, a typical uh, citizen thinks how we are doing well, because we are, uh, we are measuring the, the consumption footprint per capita, and we have some data. So maybe it has, it, it has kind of decreased from 2010, not a lot. But what is the perception of a citizen, of a consumer? Does he or she think that has decreased? And uh, to which kind of percentage? Because if uh, his or her perception is uh, more positive than the reality it is, then most probably there is this kind of rebound effect. And uh, we should consider that. I think that we should analyze also the consumer behavior and uh, the kind of perception that he has on this data. Um, and then how we are doing well also uh, I looked to this uh, graph uh, that Barbara showed, um, and it was about uh, the consumption footprint per capita. And then you see that uh, in 2018 and 2009, there was just a kind of collapse, let's say, but was uh, the main kind of reduction. Is this related to the, to the economic and financial crisis? Is it related to, G to the GDP? And how we include this uh, in the economic governance? I mean, <laughs> it's just a very uh, recent subject, but I think we don't include this uh, consumption footprint. And then, I mean, if we just promote the fact that the, the member state, they should produce more, they should have a GDP, which should increase always. I mean, we can do whatever kind of regulation, but, uh, and uh, I like, I mean, the right to repair everything uh, or echo the, the, the design, but at the end is macroeconomics also that which, which accounts. Um, and then the, the very last comment, and I apologize, is about Esther, because I, I, you spoke about um, data quality or things like that. How we include uh, the black economy? Because I mean, there are some member states where you have a lot of black economy. I come from one of that, is Italy. And how you can measure this? Uh, because first, black economy, you, you cannot track. Secondly, it's just the black economy that most probably is the less environment friendly sometimes. So these are my three questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And, uh, and I fully agree that the informal sector can be sometimes a gap in, uh, in, in all of these considerations. So perhaps could be uh, is an important point to, to bring forward. Cesar. Yes. I just wanted to um, just uh, go back on your previous questions about what could be maybe ideas that we could suggest in order to improve um, action and uh, measurement. So I'm really not speaking uh, on behalf of all, all of the French people um, <laughs> that are calculating our own carbon footprint, but from what I understood from our interviews, I realized that uh, member states across Europe might have different calculations, methods. Uh, I think France is about to use the Figaro um, multi-regional input-output, and I think other countries are more based on exio-based um, calculations. So maybe one comment would be that we could think together of how to harmonize the approach for calculating consumption-based emissions. And maybe also in order to improve um, the precision of the calculation and expand the scope, I might suggest maybe adding some extensions to um, the Figaro database, including, for example, um, more gases other than CO2, for example, related to methane, and maybe land use change as well, because I'm not sure these are included as well. So uh, these could be ideas not for action, for, for a certain type of action that um, is here to improve the data quality, uh, which is maybe a good first step uh, to harmonize between countries. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you for all the presentations. My name is Luis Cofino. I work for Eurocities, a network of more than uh, 200 big cities. So I would like to bring a bit the urban dimension to our discussion because we had the EU perspective and then the national one. I was very positively surprised to hear that 25% of the Swedish municipalities have a consumption-based target because what I see when I work with cities is that we are 
just starting to raise awareness about consumption-based um, emissions. Actually, in our membership at EuroCities, we have only three cities that have strategies on how to reduce uh, consumption-based emission, namely Stockholm, um, Paris, and Amsterdam. Um, and for those that are now a bit aware of their purchase power and how they can indirectly influence their emissions, they simply don't know where to start. So not speaking about how to reduce them, how do you calculate them and then how to reduce them. We are far away from that. So this is why um, cities, European cities, they're asking to have a EU uh, target actually to reduce uh, consumption based emission and also we were Cesar was just mentioning it uh, an EU calculation methodology to calculate and measure those emissions and then providing cities with uh, support and training on how to do that and on how to use this calculation because most of the time it's one of the difficulties they face so two questions one for the GRC are you working in such a methodology uh, that could be used at local level and then uh, for the commission but I know it's complicated we are facing election very soon but are you planning to come up with a target on reducing uh, consumption based emission in the next mandate thank you very much thank you would you like to so. Yeah, I can. Thanks for your question. Indeed, we have done a pilot a study with, for the city of Torino in collaboration with the Polytechnic of Torino that is published, where we adapted the consumption footprint framework to the city level. And that's, that's available, it should be available in our website, but uh, maybe we can share it to the information to the participants afterwards so it can arrive to you. And I, I, um, regarding the comment on the informal economy, indeed, uh, we have not uh, done such evaluation at the moment, but uh, it's interesting to maybe go to the, the data sources that we use to understand how this might or might not be included. For example, I was uh, reflecting that we use totals of food production and food trade. So, I would. I wonder now in in the data sources we use whether this might or might not include. And then regarding input output databases, also, I'm I'm not that sure actually how uh, since they consider the total emissions, this might already be included. I don't know if method 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 developers have reflected already on on this informal and informal economy. I don't know if you might have from the EEA some yeah, insights. I, I don't, <laughs> no, because I haven't looked into this in detail, whether the informal economy is included in the uh, supply use tables. But it's a good point to, mm. to look into it. Yeah? the point on the targets. Uh, well, this is a very <laughs> sensitive uh, um question uh, but uh, you know already the answer i mean uh, we are at the end of the mandate of this commission so we we will not uh, propose any concrete uh, quantitative reduction target on material footprint uh, but i would like to also mention that uh, work is ongoing now uh, from the belgian presidency to uh, to prepare a possible follow-up uh, of the circular economy action plan uh, within the next commission, also uh, collecting ideas about how uh, the next policy on circular economy can be taken up uh, by the next commission. So the issues of uh, monitoring and targets uh, are clearly part of the discussion. Um, I see that uh, the Stefano Spinacci has left, but maybe I would like just to to answer the question, uh, because uh, one of the tools that uh, the Joint Research Center has developed uh, beyond uh, the macro level on consumption footprint is uh, a consumer footprint calculator. The consumer footprint calculator is uh, an interactive tool which is available and accessible to whoever who allows uh, um, to uh, to calculate uh, uh, and to estimate uh, the own uh, uh, ecological food consumption footprint of the uh, of the user, and this uh, has really uh, three benefits. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, awareness raising, so you as a consumer can really quickly 
see how much uh, you are impacting uh, uh, the environment. Secondly, the tool provides tips. So these tips uh, allows you to decrease the consumption footprint, uh, thinking about uh, decreasing the flight that you take uh, every year or uh, the, the way you can normally eat uh, and consume uh, your meals. And uh, the third benefit is that uh, it can uh, easily, the, the, the result of this uh, uh, calculation can be easily be compared with the EU average, which is the one that is presented in the consumption footprint indicator and uh, with the member state average. So you can easily see if you as a citizen in your, in your country has a higher or lower uh, um, uh, consumption footprint. So this tool uh, has been is, is available in the platform. Uh, we are also making uh, efforts uh, to to disseminate it further. Uh, I mean everything is online. In the presentation, uh, I have also included uh, a neighbor link. And again, I would invite you to to use it uh, in your uh, daily life because in the transition, uh, everybody has a big role to play as a policymaker. Uh, as, a, as a city, uh, as, a, as a business, uh, or, uh, or as a citizen. Uh, we are all citizens, so I think that we can start from there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, indeed, the aim of, of today is really to inform the research report that is being prepared by, um, by, by our friends at SCI, but as a side effect, just simply to share, to raise awareness of the existing tools that exist on the matter. I'm sure many of us are not fully aware of the extent of the research that's been done both at the EU level and at the member state level in terms of uh, and research and initiative. So that's just a good thing to, um, to keep in mind, please. Thank you very much. My name is Bruno Capuzzi. I, I, I am from the Brazilian Trade Promotion Agency, but I will allow myself to remove this hat and speak on, the, on behalf from my, from my perspective, from, from a researcher, from enthusiast of trade and environmental uh, um, measures. So my, my, my question comes to the nice and interesting trialogue made by the European Commission and the, the, the GRC. The, the, first, the, the, the first one relates to the carbon footprint. Uh, that understand that it was, it was understood from the consumer, consumer for footprint that it stayed close to the base while the, the, the emissions from the production decreased. So uh, my question is if you understand it as a carbon leakage, because if we look to uh, academic researches such as from a professor Christopher Beringer or a professor of Valerio Costantini, they show that uh, the hypothesis of carbon leakage hasn't been proved, is a, is a, is a hypothesis from, from these kind of measures, which leads me to the C-band. And uh, we know that the C-band will apply, uh, uh, it will be applied on, on imported goods based on the, on the emissions from EU productions which leads us to two possible scenarios. When, uh, for, when foreign goods have uh, lower emissions than, than, uh, than, uh, than EU, then uh, it will be a problem for WTO co -co -co compliance and it could jeopardize efforts for, for countries to lower emissions. Or as a scenario two, when other countries actually have higher emissions than the EU, then the CBA will not, will not be, uh, will not be e efficacy. Which leads to my third and, and final comment on inter international engagement. And we know that uh, countries' commitments within the, the Paris agreements, they are laid down within their NDCs on how they're going to re, uh, re, uh, reach the, those re re reductions and we will, meaning on, on, on which sectors they will, they will choose to, to, to reduce that. But then if we have a scenario in which a measure such as, such as the CBAN will tell countries that they were going to have to reduce emissions in those sectors. How is it going to be then the international engagements uh, if, the, if, if, it's a, if such a measure as the EU would be, would be known in, in alignment with the country's autonomy to decide where they're going to reduce emissions or not? So there were three. Uh, the consumer footprint regarding to carbon leakage, uh, the efficacy of the C-band uh, when imported goods they have lower or higher emissions, and the international engagements considering council autonomy to determine their indices. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And of course, I can give the opportunity to, to respond to these points, also bearing in mind that we're reaching the end of that, uh, of that particular session. So if you'd like to respond, to, if you could ask you to please keep it uh, brief. Uh, addressing the first question, what we observe is an externalization of the impacts, meaning two things. Either you are consuming more and instead of consuming it 
from the EU production, you are importing it. That could be, for example, I think we observe that in the closed sector, no? all these uh, companies like Shane, et cetera, that are entering the market with low prices. And this is uh, promoting an increase of number of pieces or, or elements that you are consuming. So the impacts are in those production areas. Or second, we have observed also the localization of parts of the supply chain. So you are consuming um, companies that are based in the EU and that they sell the final product in the EU, but part of the supply chain is elsewhere. So the impact is taking place in third countries. So that's two of the main reasons that we have observed for this increase in the gap between the effect of the EU policy in the territory, but the continuous either stabilization or a slight increase of the consumption footprint. Uh, Thank you. No, I, I would not like to add more to what uh, uh, was mm -hmm. just said. Okay. Again, again, just to reiterate the fact that uh, um, we will need to see full implementation of the mechanism that has been adopted by, by the Commission, and this uh, probably will take some time before we get uh, the, the results. So I don't want to say that this is enough, but again, uh, this is uh, up to the next Commission uh, to, to see how we can uh, move uh, forward and even uh, advance uh, quicker, because uh, we don't have much time left. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please. Um, very shortly, Hans Walters. I'm um, chair of the board of IEP. Uh, but um, I think we have a communication problem. Um, all the policies that have been discussed today are good policies. Um, data maybe here and there are maybe not perfect, but we know more or less what we need to do. But we have farmers' protests, we have populist parties, etc. So we seem to not be able to communicate these essential policies in an credible way to our audiences, to our voters, etc. So I think we have to think also as think tanks very much about how to bring these messages across. And the Commission talked about that. But I think this is one of the essential things. Second thing is, it so, it's, should be socially just, because if we're not able to take with us the people who are less affluent, uh, if we're not able to make the energy transition socially just, etc., if we're not able to make it sure that it is affordable by raising prices while making it fairer via taxes, etc., we won't succeed. So I think communication and thinking about a socially fair way of getting these policies uh, accepted are essential for getting where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. And just things up. Not extremely fair to bring the elephant in the room at <laughs> five past on the on this on these topics, but absolutely, this is a very good time for us to re to remind ourselves. That at some point, when you talk about consumption-based emission, material footprints, and the like, the acceptability, the social acceptability of any government's measures that we bring forward is absolutely to be taken into account. So, then I'm going to pass on to back to our, back to our host, but as a, as a missing piece. So, do we agree that there are a lot of uh, uh, regulations, a lot of legislation, a lot of indicators existing at the moment? Do we agree or not that we would like to see a new legislation addressing specifically consumption-based emission, including an overall target at EU level, including Im implementation plans for the member states and the local uh, and the local authorities, including some of the right indicators and the calculation measures that could be uh, taken consistently throughout the EU? You, including support measures to make sure that everyone can be uh, can be put on board. That sounds like an easy job to do. Luckily, it's for the next legislator. But thank you so much for the uh, for your participation to to, uh, to this conversation. And please, Pa, as a host, you have the concluding remarks. 
Thank you, and I guess I have something to do then during the next legislation period. Simple. <laughs> yeah, it's simple. Well, first of all, thank you very, very much for this uh, session and this discussion. Uh, of course, this is a very, very important topic. Uh, after all, there are uh, no other econ economy in the world apart from European Union exporting as large amounts of, of uh, carbon emissions or, or climate footprint or whatever we should call it. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also uh, important to never forget from a more meta level that the basic problem is still that we are uh, using uh, fossil energy and we're stuck in an uh, um, economical system, a financial system that more or less need exponential growth to be stable. And, and then to address... Um, consumption in that perspective uh, is a bit tricky and, and uh, I, I fully agree with, with what you said, Hans, <laughs> not the least in the current political landscape where we have a lot of uh, populism just trying to say that whatever we do within the European Union is, is, is too much, uh, and it's someone else's fault, etc. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention uh, is something that I probably don't need to mention in this room, but we are really in a very, very severe climate emergency. Uh, we saw during 2023 for the first time a global temperature which was very, very near 1.5 degrees. Um, I'm, I'm a meteorologist, so I'm, I'm sort of a bit nerdy when it comes to, to these figures, but uh, with the current onset of a new El Nino at the Pacific Ocean, we will probably see uh, an even warmer year this year, 2024. Uh, uh, this um, um, acceleration of the global warming that we're seeing currently uh, is, is uh, really not well understood by the climate scientists, the climate experts. Uh, everyone that I've discussed with are, are sort of astonished by the fact that we are already at 1.5 degrees. And we have to bear in mind when we are using uh, data from IPCC, etc., uh, looking at the the the, the um, carbon uh, budgets or carbon dioxide budgets that they do not really fully implement the fact that we have this acceleration of global warming at the moment, which means that the situation is even worse than we thought just one or two years ago. But still, uh, everything we've discussed today is, is very, very important. I would like just to, to mention a few things. Um, uh, the European Parliament has again and again called for binding consumption footprint reduction targets. Uh, Barbara uh, Ioannis, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, you both and others as well have has mentioned the eighth uh, environmental action program. I was involved in negotiating that. And, and while the, the Parliament actually supported introducing uh, binding targets, then the final legislation after negotiation with member states says such targets should be introduced as appropriate. But, but to me, it's obvious that it is very much appropriate right now. Uh, and in the latest resolution, the Parliament also uh, adopted to establish its mandate for COP28. Um, the Parliament affirmed some of my amendments to the resolution, which stress that the latest IPCC reports recognition of the importance and also mitigation potential of sufficiency and demand side policies. And it also highlights that demand reduction and shifts in consumption patterns can reduce global um, greenhouse gas emissions in end use sectors by as much as 40 to 70 percent by 2050. And, and we encouraged all parties to take this into account when they establish their NDCs. Uh, and in all of this, as, as is true with all policy making, uh, we need to take due account to equity and uh, equality in the measures that we adopt, as many of you have mentioned. And uh, the potential to reduce emission by reducing consumption is, of course, highest in countries and population segments 
with relatively high levels of consumption. We, we must never forget that we need to combine ecological sustainability with social sustainability. Uh, myself, I worked uh, quite a lot on consumption-based emissions from the perspective of the textile sector through my work in the EU's textile strategy. Uh, and in this sector, as in many other sectors as well, but in this sector, it's clear that it's not the ones with few means that need to change their fashion, consumption habits. And in this way, more sustainable consumption patterns and habits is also a question of, of equity and equality. Um, the Parliament, though, through its adoption of the EU textile strategy and, and building on its position on the Circle uh, Economy Action Plan, is clear on the fact that a paradigm shift is really needed to end this overproduction and unsustainable uh, consumption. And uh, uh, my co-host Sarah also mentioned the problems with, with overconsumption and overproduction. Uh, in her introduction. Um, uh, um, I mean, let's face it, uh, we're doing some good things. Eco Design uh, Directive, Deforestation Law and, and CBAM, uh, etc. But we also need really binding uh, targets for this because we're not on track. Uh, and we need to clearly steer uh, all relevant legislation, uh, such as legislation on eco-design or on waste, to be in line with that target that we set. Uh, the better holistic view, as I mentioned um, earlier. Um, and as, um, uh, as a Green, I also need to stress that Green politics uh, often get sort of misconstrued as to, to be moralizing or, or putting this on, on an individual uh, uh, responsibility, which is, of course, completely wrong. We need to, to, to change uh, the system, the society. Um, and, and there is, to me anyhow, <laughs> nothing moralizing at all in recognizing that all emissions need to be reduced or about the principle that a polluter pays or, or having targets and measures at systematic, at systemic level. Um, as the EEA has highlighted um, today and, and also in, in their monitoring report, uh, the progress towards the eighth EAP objectives for those who live in the EU are unlikely to decrease their material footprints in the coming years. And this is the same, of course, when it comes to the Fit for 55 climate uh, overall targets. We are not in line to even reach 55% by 2030, whereas uh, science says that we need to be much more ambitious, at least uh, trying to reach 70%, but we're not even in line with 55%. And still, most of the uh, uh, communication from EU uh, sounds like, well, we're doing this and we're best in the world and we're on line to, to, to be in reach with the Paris Agreement, et cetera. Unfortunately, we, we're not. Um, um, uh, the eighth EAP also sets out a um, uh, clear objective, as many of you mentioned, uh, to, to transition our economy to a well-being economy within the planetary boundaries. Um, uh, as a long-time friend with uh, Johan Rockström, I remember when Johan and uh, James Hansen and others came up with these planetary boundaries, and as you probably know, the planetary boundary for climate is 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. And we're currently at 420. Pre-industrial levels, 280. That means that the planetary boundary says that, yes, we can increase the, at least for a while, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 25% relative to the pre-industrial levels. Now we're at 50%. And we're still talking about climate neutrality by 2050, which means that the amount of carbon dioxide will increase until 2050, which means that the global warming will continue to accelerate until 2050. So we're far outside of the planetary boundaries. 
and still a lot of, of uh, the members of this European Parliament, not the least in, in the Environmental Committee, often uh, communicate and discuss as if we still have some more time to waste, as if we would still be within the planetary boundaries. Uh, unfortunately, we're outside of it. Uh, and when it comes to economy, uh, finally, I would like to stress the fact that we, we mustn't forget that the economy is really dependent on ecology. Uh, from a bigger perspective, economy and ecology is, is more or less the same. Uh, but we've created this uh, economical system, this financial system that, that uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, first of all, more or less needs some sort of, of uh, um, uh, exponential growth to be, be stable, but also uh, a system that, that isn't really at all aware of, of taking full responsibility of the ecological uh, situation. And... Uh, uh, the way that we, we govern our societies, uh, the different countries and the European Union and, and from a global perspective, of course, has to reflect this. But once again, thank you very much for all your thoughts and, and input in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.